for us here. And the, the general topic is um, why our various stakeholders, and I'm particularly thinking of internal company stakeholders, just don't agree on priorities. Often we think of the product management problem as being very analytical and putting the best spreadsheets or columns or weightings or strategy together, but it's more than that. Uh, what I see everywhere in the world is that um, our different internal groups actually have different objectives, different goals, and so getting them to agree can be very, very difficult. Uh, good. Here's a, a quick slide about me. For those who don't know me, uh, I've, I'm based here in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, and I've been doing mostly enterprise software product management since the 1980s. So this is not a new thing, although I do find uh, as I travel the world that different companies and different cities have heard about product management, you know, maybe more recently than this and think it's new. Um, maybe more important for me, I've been uh, a solo consultant for the last uh, 19 years, and I come at this with a lot of time and grade in the product management role, director VP, did the CEO thing a couple of times. And then over the last uh, 15 years or so, I've done a series of what we call the smoke jumper VP of product jobs. So I join usually a pure software company as their head of product for a quarter or two if they forgot to have someone in charge of product management or the, uh, the last person in that job quit or there's some, usually some organizational issue at the executive level. So, uh, so I drop in and out of software companies to get their product management teams organized and straightened out. Um, if you've been to my website, I'll have um, you know, information at the very bottom there um, on the last slide, but my website has about uh, 19 years worth of posts and talks and tools and videos and uh, podcasts and such on product management because I've been just at this a long time. Great, so enough about me. Let's talk about um, what I see as the sort of fundamental patterns around roadmaps and prioritization. And I should actually back up a step because there's usually two very, very different kinds of companies building software. And I'm really gonna be talking about only one. So for me, my focus is on pure software companies that make software as their core product to sell out to the market. I think of them as software product companies. And that's distinct from uh, contract development or professional services companies that build software on contract or at the request of some other company that's gonna go market or use or deliver those out for value. And we get very, very different models. Uh, I'm gonna be mostly talking about folks who are building software to bring directly out into the market as a way to uh, earn revenue on the software itself. Again, as distinct from contract development, I know a lot of folks in the Ukraine are doing contract or professional services work for other companies and they don't have the market risk. So uh, that'll take us in two very different directions. And when I think about companies that build software as the product that they bring to market, what I notice is the executive team, this, this internal stakeholders, each have a very different view of what's important or what's most important to put next into their software products. And that we as analytical, you know, sort of number driven quantitative folks would like to believe that our spreadsheets and our algorithms and our columns and rating schemes are going to be enough to convince everybody, but I just don't see it happening. And so we'll take that apart a little bit and talk about how different parts of a company, uh, different parts of the organization may in fact see uh, opposing uh, priorities or, um, you know, or weightings to apply to these things. What's their sampling bias? What are they being measured for? Okay, so um, the other important thing here, I'm gonna do a little economics for us. If you've got a software team of, you know, six to nine people, which tends to be what a, a well-formed uh, scrum team is, plus a product manager, you know, here in San Francisco, that's gonna cost you something on the order of a million, a million euro a year. And, you know, prices vary. And this last week with everybody closing down their companies, maybe it's less expensive, but order of magnitude, 
you know, we'll see it's about a million euros a year to have a team plus a product manager work on something, right? And that's important because at a company that builds software for the market for a living, in general, we find that only maybe one in five or one in six of the employees actually work on building the software. The five out of six employees are in marketing or sales or support or finance or legal or real estate or human resources. And so for every million euros that you spend building product, it turns out you actually need to bring in um, six million euros worth of revenue in order to justify um, having a team to build software and bring it out to market, you're gonna need to bring in about six times their, um, their cost. If you unpacked, if you looked at say a profit loss statement from Microsoft or Oracle or SAP or one of the really big software companies, you'll see that about one in six of the dollars they spend or the euros they spend is on building product and five of the six, six is on delivering it, supporting it, selling it and funding the rest of the company. So. Therefore, if I, as a product manager, want to get one more team assigned to what I'm doing, it means I need to not just pay for the team itself, I need to bring in five or six times as much money, and I'm going to have to justify that work. Um, but most importantly, if we're in the software business, and we're selling software to many, many customers, the identical software, by the way, excuse my office manager, Kat, who's helping here, um, what we'll find is that in the pure software business, it generally costs less than about 3% of the revenue we charge to add one more customer to our SaaS platform, to add one more consumer to our dating app, to add one more company to our email platform. So the, the most important thing here is we don't wanna look at the cost of the team, we wanna look at the revenue that that team's gonna generate, right? So the, the takeaway here, if you're a product company, building software as your product, you're not actually trying to minimize development costs. You're trying to build the best software you can so that you can get a lot more customers for those same bits. Uh, once you cross break even, once you've brought in enough money to pay for your team, it's all margin. It's 97% margin. So this is an essential part of the basic assumption that we find when we're building software for market. <clears throat> we're not trying to have the cheapest people the youngest designers who've never done it before, product managers who, who are first timers and therefore we can save on, on uh, salary, we're looking to build the best software because that's gonna actually lead to much more profitable companies. So said another way, if you're in the software business and you're delivering software directly to the market for revenue, the profits, the money you make, is all in the nth copy, the nth subscriber, the nth unit, the nth transaction. Once we've built our funds transfer system, we can transfer infinite amounts of funds at nearly no cost. Once we've set up our content and subscribers, we can add subscribers at almost no cost. Once we've built our enterprise uh, sales management system, we can add new enterprises to that at almost no cost. So again, the profits are all in the nth copy. They're not in the first copy. Again, back to professional services. If you're building something for just one customer, at their request to their specs, then you have to make enough money on that first copy to pay all your people and have a profit. That's the professional services business. In the software business in the market as our core product, we're gonna make money not on the first customer, but after we pass break even. Um, I'll pause if, if there's questions for that. Let's, uh, let's jump in to make sure that I'm not running off the edge. Okay. All right, so having set that up, the last couple of challenges that we have internally and externally, this is what I call the good idea train. And I think we find that every product person, every time they open up email, they check Slack, they look for the post-it notes on their desk. What we find as product folks is that everyone else in our company, as well as every one of our customers and channels and resellers has lots of good ideas for us, right? Every day we get, dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of ideas from everyone else in the world. And honestly, we know that most of those ideas are not new. They're not particularly good. They're not well thought out. Um, these suggestions and ideas tend to be from people who don't really know how our products work. 
have not thought deeply about workflows, um, don't understand that when we add more features to our system, it becomes harder to use, not easier to use. And so we're in a place where lots of folks are bringing us really good ideas, but honestly, they're not that good. And uh, the second point to make here is when we get these good ideas from people, especially our sales organizations, um, the folks who talk to us or write us notes tend to say that everyone needs the item that they're identifying for us. And that's generally not true. So if you're a salesperson, you're reporting what your most recent customer call had in it, where somebody said, oh, I wish we could add this new feature to the system. Um, but the salespeople will almost always describe it as everyone, uh, which is of course not true. And so it falls on us as product managers, as product owners, to ask the hard questions, to go out back into the field, to figure out how many customers really need something and whether they've correctly described it. Um, in general, I'm not excited about the product managers on my team just writing down what somebody says they need and then carrying it over as a user story. Because it's almost always true that that's poorly understood, poorly thought out, and isn't really very important. But we face this all day, every day. So we need to be able to thank the folks who bring us good ideas without promising to do the thing they ask us to do. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so, and I'm gonna do just a little bit of, of um, uh, breakdown by organization here. So it's a bit of a build here. When I talk with the folks in my company who are in customer support or technology support and who answer calls from end users, I tend to hear one particular kind of problem, right? And so the customer support people are mostly going to tell me about current users, because if you're not currently a user of our system, you're not reporting bugs. And they're mostly gonna tell me about the most frequent, most frustrating bugs that customers call in about most of the time, which is really good information because these are things we should fix. But as we see, we go down this page, there's actually different sampling that each of our organizations is gonna have and so the customer support folks are mostly reporting pretty obvious things, whether they're easy to fix or not. Let's go ahead. If you're doing any sort of enterprise or business to business work, you may have another team that you call customer success or onboarding. And those are the people who are trying to get those new customers working on the, on the software that's already been paid for. And so these folks tend to see a different set of problems. They tend to see problems with installation instructions, with integrations of third-party data. Um, they tend to find out that our customers bought our product for the wrong reasons to solve the wrong problems. And so the kinds of, of issues or ideas or suggestions that we get from our customer success team, from our onboarding team, are certainly about new users, but they tend to be about the ones who are first on our platform and often it's a confusion or, or frustration that our product doesn't really do what they wanted it to do. Okay, let's keep marching down. If you have an inside sales team or a telesales team, and this tends to be for small businesses or selling relatively inexpensive products where it's, it's not enough money to send sales teams out to do face-to-face -face visits with customers. Um, these folks, and often we're in a market where we have a freemium product or a very inexpensive product, uh, the challenges that our sales team, our inside sales or telesales team has for us is sometimes our freemium product is so good that nobody wants to upgrade. And so the sales team is frustrated because they wish that the freemium product was not so good. On the other hand, sometimes the complaints are that our freemium product isn't good enough and therefore, um, customers are not willing to stay with us long enough to bother to check about upgrading. And the third set of complaints or issues I usually see from inside sales and telesales is that we have very general market materials. We have uh, information that describes our product in general, but it doesn't talk about the uses in a medical or hospital market, or it doesn't talk about the uses in a automotive assembly market or in a big bank situation. And so our telesales people are usually asking us 
to make much more specific versions of all of our marketing materials so that they sound just like the customer they called on today. Okay, catching our breath a little bit. You'll see there's a pattern here, which is that each of the groups in our company is getting different sets of input from different folks. Okay, if you have an enterprise sales team, enterprise sales for me means probably sales of, I don't know, 50,000 to $100,000 or more per year. And these sales teams may only have a few customers, but they are often the very biggest customers that our company has. And every one of those uh, big customers has one or two features that we're never going to build because they're way off the roadmap and they're not for general use. But our sales teams report the features that the customers complain about, right? The other thing they complain about all the time is when we slow down our roadmap to do that one or two special features that the really biggest customers want, they then complain that product and engineering are late or slow and we can't do the roadmap work, of course, because we're doing the special work that came from the enterprise team. Right, last two here. Um, when our engineering team looks at our backlog and our priorities and what they think is important, they're almost always seeing our technical debt and our DevOps infrastructure and the things that they need to do on the engineering and development and design side to make their job easier. And of course, they're right. We should be retiring some technical debt, but we probably can't only work on technical debt and just make the engineering team happy. Okay, last group for every software company, there's of course an executive team and they tend to be very distracted and they tend to only speak directly with the very largest customers in the sales cycle and the very largest customers who have support escalations or problems. And so the executive team is always asking us for some new shiny feature, something cool and special, something we can put on the website or the webinar or the brochure that will excite customers to talk to us, right? So as you can see, we've now taken apart a software company and we've identified that every one of the groups has really a different set of inputs, of biases, of customer interactions, and therefore a very different set of priorities. Okay, I'm gonna catch my breath here for just a moment. In fact, I'm gonna turn off sharing and see if we have any questions. Anybody? I've got the open questions and I've got the chat thing open. If anybody has something for me. No. Hey guys, okay. so if you want to ask the questions, just make sure um, you can use the Q&A box or well, you can also drop your line into the chat box. Sure. Or if somebody's really brave and wants to take themselves off mute, that's okay too. All right, we'll save it. Let's keep going. I'll come back into share mode here. Um, that didn't work. Okay, let's try yeah, it. Yeah, it did. Sorry. It did? Okay. Yeah, it um, was there, too, but not. Too, too, many, too many windows. Okay, good. All right, so we're back. So, so let me tell this story now from a pie chart point of view. Um, and pie charts, by the way, are something I really love when I work with executives because pie charts have this special magical feature that if you make one slice of the pie bigger, you have to make another slice of the pie smaller. And that seems very silly, except that almost every executive I work with wants us to do more with less resources. And so they're always asking for the and, which is, can't we do everything on the roadmap and these two things that I thought of on my commute in today, or this one thing I just got a customer call about. And so uh, we're gonna use pie charts to show our executive team what's happening. And if I break out this pie chart, if I'm an enterprise sales team, a sales company, enterprise software company, and again, this is gonna be very different if you're in the custom development or contract development world. But usually I find that we spend about half of our engineering points or story points or person weeks or whatever it is on features that our customers really see. So these are the new menus and new reports and all of the interfaces and all the things that customers actually ask for by name. And we're only spending about half of our points on this 
because there's other things we must do to stay in the software business. Among those things, the, uh, the red slice here, and it's usually something like 25 or 30% of all of our work is making sure that our software infrastructure works, our security is up, we've got scalability and availability, uh, we are monitoring and um, tracking what's happening with our stuff, we've instrumented our software, this might be where microservices and things go, right? If we don't do these things, then our software fails and our customers all leave us. But we almost never see a request from a customer to improve our scalability. They assume we're going to do that. They think that's part of our job. And so it almost never comes in as a request from the outside world to the roadmap, yet we have to do it. Okay, what else do we have in here? Um, there's a lot of work we do on the development side itself to make sure we're able to build software. Test automation, bug fixes, DevOps, uh, any kind of training, um, you know, hiring and mentoring and bringing on new engineers. There's a lot of work that our development team does that the world does not see. But if we don't do these things, then our team quits or we fall apart or we can't check in more code. So if we don't do those again, we're out of business. And then the last thing that we see, good product companies do a lot of validation and sizing and early design. Sometimes these are MVPs, right? So if we're not spending five or 10% of all of our effort trying to make sure we're building the right things and understanding the market and interviewing lots of folks and taking our very early pencil sketches or balsamics out to show people to critique, then we're probably wasting about half of all of our energy. Because I observe that when we don't test, when we don't validate, when we don't do early, early, early alpha work, then much of what we build is wasted. And so this is what a healthy, strong, long-lived software company's investment portfolio might look like. Um, uh, we have a joke here in the United States where um, uh, in January and February after the winter holidays and Christmas, everyone joins a gym because they've eaten too much and they've put on too much weight. But it turns out there's no health benefits to joining a gym. You actually have to go. And at least here in the U.S., lots of people join gyms and they never, ever show up. Uh, and the reason that's important here it's because we're going to see the, the, um, the story that has our executives borrow from the red or the light blue or the gray slices just for this one quarter or just for this one sprint to work on extra features um, because they promise us that next quarter or next month we'll be able to go back and even this up. And it almost never happens. We'll, we'll have a picture of how that works. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, and the thing with enterprise software, which is again my starting point, is that no product anywhere is a perfect fit for any big enterprise. And the roadmap is really the starting point for the sales team and the customer to try to ask us for more things. So we expect if we're in the enterprise software business that every single one of our customers is gonna have a pretty long list of things that we don't do. And in fact, we are probably never going to do because if we take just a couple of items off of each of our enterprise customers lists, we're gonna put 100% all of our team against those special items for that one set of customers. And if you remember back to the beginning, the way we make money in the software business is we sell exactly the same bits to many, 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 many customers. If we're gonna sell the bits to only one customer, we probably have to start by charging at least six times as much as we're gonna get paid for that work. And even there, we may be losing our mainstream uh, customers because we're not improving our core software. Okay, so let's keep going. And then here's something we also know about enterprise or business to business sales teams, right? We hire them, we train them, we reward, we reward them for closing individual accounts and extracting the most money out of individual accounts. They're persistent, you know, they're persuasive, they tell a good story, they're very convincing, and they're really good at finding a champion within that customer or prospect who will say yes. So if the first people they call on say no, they go up the organization to find somebody more senior, more important with bigger budget who might say yes. And that's all great, 
But let's remember that when one of those sales reps comes to my product manager and says, I need this crazy feature for this really, really big company, right? You know, I'm sure you guys aren't doing a lot of work for Gazprom, but if they wanted something that would be a big account or Deutsche Bank or, you know, a Bank National de Paris, um, they're very persuasive. And so after the product manager says, no, you may not have that, we're never going to build it. What our sales reps do, of course, with all this training, is they go up our own organization. They go right to the CEO and they explain how this is a really big deal and we should interrupt our roadmap and our backlog for just this one thing, right? So the way I talk about it, it's a picture from an old movie that you may or may not know, I'll keep going, is that we pay our enterprise sales teams to break our product plans, to ruin our roadmaps, to find all kinds of interrupts to get in the way of what we're planning to do because otherwise they don't get paid. Okay, we've set up a real problem here. So now let's come back uh, to the few words and, and see if anybody recognizes these words. Um, and I apologize, these are in, in English, you'll choose it in your own, um, your own native language, but I'm always looking for these words, just, every, and only, because when my sales rep comes back from a big deal, here's what they tell me. If product just understood how important this thing was to my customer, they would do it. As if we had engineers waiting around with nothing else to do. What else do they say? They say, every customer wants what my customer wants. Now, of course, this uh, enterprise sales rep may only meet two or three customers this year, and they're going to tell the most persuasive story. What else do they tell us? They tell us that the thing they want can't be very hard. It's probably only 10 lines of code, right? Um, if anybody doesn't know the answer here, when someone not in engineering or development says this, the right answer is to turn your keyboard around, give them the keyboard and invite them to write the 10 lines of code. Because <laughs> of course that's not really how it is. And then the last thing I hear all the time is that product development need to be more responsive. They need to listen better. Again, this is a, a mental model. This is a belief that says, Development and product are really waiting around with nothing to do. And if they just understood how important my deal was, they would agree, right? And of course this works if you only have one deal, but if you have 50 enterprise deals, clearly this can't be true. Okay, so let's come back to our pie chart and we're gonna do a little build uh, of, of what happens in this scenario, right? So here's the pie chart we had before, right? about half of the points being spent on outward visible features and you know a, a big slice for internal infrastructure and test automation and, and engineering support and a little bit for validation. So after one of our sales reps brings a really big deal in and comes to the product manager who says no and then comes to me as the head of product management and I say no and then they go to the CEO and explain how big this deal was. And this is the story they tell. See the little green slice here? We're gonna do only this one special thing this quarter. It's really small. It won't interfere with anything. It's only 10 lines of code. How hard could it be? And notice our CEO is gonna push us really hard to agree to this because of course it's a big deal. And the very first place we take time out of is all the forward thinking validation, all the design early work, a lot of the sizing because we've already promised everything else in this pie, everything else in the, in the current sprint and the, the near term roadmap. So we're gonna give up on the future just a little bit. Now, having been forced to do this, it also turns out, by the way, every sales rep in the world is an optimist and every customer thinks something's easy. So when we agree to do this one tiny deal specific item, it turns out, that it's actually bigger than we planned. It's always bigger than we planned. And notice now, we've moved all of the validation work out just for this short amount of time. And so for a while, we're gonna do no future thinking, no checking to make sure that our next set of features are useful, no good interrogation and interviewing of customers for a little while to do this one small thing, right? Which isn't good, but it's not terrible. The next thing that happens though, is that our enterprise sales rep who made a lot of commission on this deal is gonna take all of the other sales reps out for drinks and explain how easy it was to get this one special deal pushed through 
by escalating to the head of sales and the CEO or your managing director. And so now all of the salespeople know how to do this. And so what happens next in, in the quarter is that we get another one or two or three or six of these escalations. And we'll see that our green slice starts to eat up the whole pie, right? Now we're doing less bug fixing. We're doing less test automation. We're doing less training and hiring of executives, I'm sorry, of engineers, developers. We're working less on security and scalability. And we even taken a few things out of the blue slice. So now we're also late on our roadmap because we had promised lots of things to customers and one by one we're dropping those out to replace them with individual items that are good for one of our enterprise customers but don't turn out to be of general use. So this is a very difficult problem and notice it's not a problem about spreadsheets, it's not a problem about user stories or structuring the backlog. This is about how executives work with each other and the organizational politics of deciding what gets done. Who are the people in the company who have enough clout, who have enough power, who have enough political strength to force engineering and product to take a good plan and to change it into a sales-driven plan for the quarter, which doesn't lead to as much revenue and short changes our product over the long term. Um, so the reason I come into companies often is because they're having this problem in great seriousness and I have to sit down with the rest of the executive team and figure out how we're going to keep this from happening right and it's again it's not a spreadsheet problem it's not a user story or, or points problem this is about behavior at the executive level so one of the things that we've done at several of my companies is we've tried to figure out how to push some of this decision making back through to the folks who are asking for things. And so I have one model that I really liked. Uh, we call it the magic bullet model. Here's the picture. But I, I usually try to make an agreement with the head of sales, the worldwide VP of sales or you know, revenue, chief revenue officer, whatever it is, to give that person one choice every quarter for something that they can jam in, push in, demand in the roadmap but it has to be of a certain size and they only get one, right? So um, it's a way we would say visible scorekeeping. So for instance, the last time I did this, I had an agreement with the head of sales that he could ask any time during the quarter for one improvement that was no bigger than one engineer week. And then I gave him a little token. It wasn't actually a bullet, it was a small stuffed plush toy, but he had to give me back the token when he asked for that special piece of work. And the reason I had him give me back the token was because a week later he had forgotten, and he, as he will always forget, he had forgotten what it was he'd asked for because the next deal needed something and the deal after that needed something. And so this was a, a special physical reminder when he reaches into his desk to get it a second time, it's gone. And that's really important because in general, our head of sales, our sales vice president, is paid on the total revenue of the company, not just one deal. And so that's somebody who has a good visibility into where to spend their very limited budget. Right? The other thing I often look at is how we pay our salespeople. Um, this you may or may not know, but it's true. Salespeople do what we pay them to do, not what we want them to do. So if they're doing something that isn't the right thing, generally the fastest way to fix it isn't to talk with them, scold them, have them in meetings, do presentations. The fastest way is to look at their compensation plan and figure out how to pay them more for what we want them to do and pay them less for what we don't want them to do. Um, this is less of a challenge. This isn't as big a challenge in pure um, outsourced or professional services or contract firms because in fact, every customer gets their own code line. And so the sales reps are paid for the size of the deal. But again, if you're in an enterprise software model where you're selling the same enterprise software to lots of folks, we might wanna do some of these things. For instance, what if we didn't pay full commission to the sales rep until the customer was installed and running? That encourages sales reps to walk away from deals that are gonna need lots and lots of special work, 
because it may take a long time. What if we gave them extra compensation on standard software licenses, but we deducted, we had a negative for every dollar or euro of professional services that was included in that contract. They would very quickly stop selling specials and professional services, and they would start selling the standard software we have, right? Um, what if we paid them extra at renewal time for selling our brand new products? Uh, often I'm working with teams where the sales team is able to hit its quota just by selling the old product. And so they never bother to sell the new product. My engineering and development team has built a whole series of new products, but no one's selling them because it's not important. We might create sales incentives to give bonuses for selling the brand new products, right? Again, the point of this is to think about the problem of prioritization, not just as an algorithm, not just as a spreadsheet, not just as a business case, but to understand why the organization behaves the way it does. Okay, let's do a quick wrap up and then uh, I'll take some Q&A here. So here's the points I have to take away. Um, I believe we as product people have to look for patterns and we look, look for patterns, not just in the product or the technology. We look for patterns in the people we work with and the kinds of observations or learning they have, right? I believe that prioritization conflicts are, the word here is ir irreconcilable. They will always happen. It's not about personalities. It's not really about capacity. Um, I know that my executives can think of things my engineering team should do a hundred times faster than my engineering team can ever do them. So we never get to the end of the list of what any executive wants, right? So we must start to make choices and we must line up our incentives to make good choices. Third one, we as product managers, product owners, product leaders have to think about the aggregate, the total impact of doing special items that are not on the roadmap. Interrupts, whatever we want to call those. Because if we look at them one at a time, if we look at them individually, we don't see how much effort they're taking. We don't see how destructive they are. So as product folks, we need to add up those pie charts so we can go back to our leadership, back to our executives, and show them the cost of all these one-offs and specials and interrupts. And then finally, we have to get buy-in, we have to get agreement from the different leaders of the different organizations to share in making trade-offs. If everybody wants more than they can get and it's up to product to solve it, uh, we're usually in a place where we cannot by ourselves get out of the organizational problem we've created. Okay, I'm gonna leave these up for a second before I flash my contact information and then we'll take some time for questions. All right, so here's how to find me. Uh, and by the way, uh, before somebody asks, yes, here in the United States, I, I say my last name as Mironov, but it does come from Mironov, which is uh, my grandfather came from your part of the world about 110 years ago. And, uh, and that's the name that a lot of folks in your part of the world may have. Uh, you'll see that my domain name is the same as my last name. That's because I bought it in 1992 before a lot of folks were really on the network. So email and website, and they're all the same. Okay, I'm gonna come back to our little uh, takeaways here and then stop a share so that we can uh, ask and answer some questions. Okay, we're back. Um, I hope that wasn't too fast. I hope my, uh, um, my technology story is one that some of you relate to. Um, go ahead, fire when ready. Questions? Okay, do we have questions? Guys, you can write the questions or um, well, in the Q&A box. We can raise the hand and actually, if you do so, I'll let you talk, so no problem. Okay, meanwhile, I probably want to, um, I'm gonna ask a question like, Okay. Uh, so we're talking about the, the stakeholders and at some point you see that the stakeholder um, seems to understand the importance uh, but somehow doesn't really in, engage to support um, certain 
certain priority, for example. So how, obviously, right. how do you deal with that? So, so I think of it, so this is a people problem, right? And so uh, I usually say that the, the person who is the most senior product person, the, if, the, if you have a chief product officer, um, this is about pulling those folks aside and having a lot of conversations with them when no one else is listening. Um, I use those pie charts all the time to show the impact. Sometimes I will dig in a little bit to the data and I will name the specific deals that came in that the executive team, that the VP of sales or the CEO or the stakeholder pushed on us. And then I'll go back and we'll figure out whether we even closed that deal or whether it led to revenue. So I'm actually looking for ways to embarrass people, but one-on-one -on -one where no one else can really hear <clears throat> because I'm trying to educate them about what the results are, what the impact is. Um, but as I said, if you're on the sales side, you're being paid, I think, to break the system here. So it means going up in the organization until we can find somebody who has the right authority to get the sales team to be rewarded for the right behavior. Um, again, notice that's not in the job description of, of your individual contributor, product manager or product owner. Um, okay, Olga has a question. How can I learn about the organization behaving remotely, which is really much more important in the last few weeks? Um, almost every company in my neighborhood is now going remote and people are learning how to do that. Um, what I see in remote organizations, some of them are great, but um, there's a lot of exchange of email and Slack and sort of um, text stuff that doesn't really get to the issue. So uh, often I'll see some of the stakeholders simply send the same demand or request 50 times because they think we're not listening, right? And so I I'm usually trying to find a way to get a more personal connection Again, whether it's Zoom or Hangouts or you know, Teams or whatever you're using, Skype. Um, when I've exchanged emails or, or Slack messages or something else with somebody three or four times and they're not getting what I'm trying to tell them, uh, I usually try to get a synchronous voice-to-voice -voice or face-to-face -face connection because clearly they're not hearing us. Um, or you know, we do the same thing they do, which is, Sometimes you have to go to the boss of the person who's pushing you because they're not getting the answer. Okay. Okay. What um, else do we so, have? Uh, let me ask one of the questions I think we had uh, from people who looked at the, at the point of their registration. Yes. And um, that one was about um, how to facilitate the, between the stakeholders to have different version on the product backlog. Right. I usually think of this as, yeah, I think of this as a budget, okay? So remember we go back to our pie chart and I will push forward the budget that says, we're gonna spend half of our story points or engineering weeks, whatever we're measuring on customer facing new features. Right, and then all of those new features get put into the same sort of sub backlog to fight against each other, to be ranked against each other based on usually some very, very lightweight business case or impact, right? So I also see that stakeholders almost never really figure out why something's important and how we're going to measure it. They just demand things because they hear that they want it. And so when we come back with better sizing and measuring and impact analysis. For instance, if we can only get two new features in this quarter, we should probably do some financial forecasting about which two new features are going to lead to the most new customers or the most upsell or the most uh, reduced churn. And then we can put that number forward and say, you know, feature number 12, we forecast is worth between a million and two million euros next year. So please, stakeholder, explain to me how your feature, which is gonna push out the feature we just talked about, is gonna return more money to the organization than two million euros. So now we've got a, a metric for the right-hand side of that pie 
where we can sort the new features and the customer facing things based on say, you know, next year's revenue. And folks with really good ideas that don't, that can't explain why they're important, go to the bottom of the stack. Likewise, on the tech debt side, we're gonna use a different metric. And so I'm gonna go back to my engineering and development team and ask which of the many kinds of tech debt they think is gonna make them the most, um, you know, give them the most throughput improvement, make them the happiest, reduce the most uh, incoming tickets. Because our budget's only gonna allow us to spend, you know, 95 story points this quarter, whatever it is, on tech debt reduction. And I don't have to be the expert at that, but I do wanna to delegate to my team a little bit of budget for fixing tech debt. Likewise, when we look at scalability and security, we can't do all the scalability and security we want. So we're gonna put all the scalability ability stuff in its own stack. We're gonna force rank those with those stakeholders who tend to be in the engineering and support organizations. And we're gonna do the ones that fit our budget that are the best, right? So now we have some tools that let us split out the new features from the tech debt, from the validation and the bug fixes. And so we can match up our different stakeholders we can go to our support team and say, we're only gonna be able to spend 65 story points this month on fixing bugs, but we would like your suggestions for which bugs are most important or highest volume. And if those fit within our 65 uh, story point budget, those are the ones we'll fix first, right? So what we're doing here is we're matching our different stakeholders to the different parts of the pie chart and we're we're then doing optimization or choices within each slice so that each of our stakeholders gets something. Does that make sense? Well, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, Good. I hope that that makes sense to the other participants right here. Right. And, um, and by the way, if we, if we go back to our, our health club problem, we, I try not to let anyone borrow from anyone else's slice because everybody wants 100% of the pie. All right, sorry, keep going. Okay, guys, girls, do please remember, drop your questions into the chat, raise your hand, or use the Q&A box to, to ask the questions. Um, while you consider the question to type in, um, there was a, an interesting question, like how to say no to a stakeholder mm -hmm. in killing the CEO of PAD project. So basically, that's kind of yes. a tricky thing, right. yeah, very kind of a it's very tricky. sentimental part in it. Of course, right. And, and I try not to just say no, right, because no is not the answer they want. There's, there's a better version of no that I reach for. And I always try to keep my current roadmap printed out on paper in my pocket at all times so that I don't have to log in and give this answer after fussing a lot with a bunch of software. But I'd rather say, here are the three or four things that are in the roadmap that we're currently working on. Um, by the way, our team is busy. Our team is full. There's no excess capacity. So CEO, let's look at the four things we're currently building. And please help me figure out which one of the four things that are on our roadmap have been promised to customers and will deliver revenue and joy in the next quarter, you would like to cancel or delay for a quarter to add your thing in, right? And notice that that's not an and question, that's an exclusive or question, because now I get to share the challenge with the CEO, who is my boss, and if the CEO or the, or the managing director wants to cancel something we've already promised to all of our customers, that's gonna be a very painful choice. It might be the right one, it's usually not but by reminding them what we're currently building because they've forgotten, they always forget, it's not their job to remember. Um, I'm helping share that pain of decision-making, right? If I just say no, they think it's because I don't understand. If I just say no, they think I'm not listening or I didn't do my homework. When I show them the list of things we're currently working on, now we can have a smart or sensible discussion about priorities because priorities is about delaying something in order to do something else. Mm, okay, well, that sounds 
it's actually very reasonable. And here we have a question chat from Andre. It says, are there the cases when sales-driven organization is more effective? Um, the only place I've seen this being really effective is in a pure development or a pure contract shop where you treat every new deal as a, or, or each new customer as a separate project. So if you're gonna create, if you're gonna hire or assign a team just to do what Royal Bank of Canada wants, um, then you're in the contract development business and it is in fact purely sales led. Um, when I, almost every place else when I see sales driven, I see the sales reps pushing for things that are not really of use, general use in the market on average. And what that means is you spend more and more time on fewer and fewer customers and we violate, we break the very first economic principle, which is that if we can sell a sa the same bits, identical bits to one more customer, uh, we make 95% margin on it. So um, I see sales driven organizations moving very quickly toward a contract or custom development model. And in that case, you have to charge a lot more money because you have to charge enough that every single deal pays for every single developer that works on that deal. Okay, question, where does the percentages come from? Because I believe it will be different depending on a company. Absolutely, really good question from Yuri. Um, that's a sort of average typical thing that I see out of enterprise or business to business pure software companies, right? Uh, it's not perfect. It's not, you know, there's no standard here. That comes out of my data. I, I would suggest that when I lean in with companies to do this for real, I suggest we take the last quarter or two of work, you know, maybe we pull out last quarter's JIRA tickets and we sort them into those four slices and we see what our current number is. And then we ask whether we should adjust that. Uh, and sometimes things are just fine and we don't need to make changes. But for instance, if you're in this problem space where you're sales driven, you will be surprised and all of your executives will be surprised at how much of your pie is being assigned or consumed or used for individual sales driven deals. And so this is a way to make it more visible. All, all good agilists like to have information radiators or ways to see what's happening. So I always recommend that you go back and do the work, figure out what your current pie looks like, and then what are the organizational changes or the budget changes or the stakeholder changes so you can make that say 5% better next quarter in the right direction. So, you know, um, consumer companies, if you're doing consumer software, they tend to have a lot fewer specials. Um, if you're doing uh, back end infrastructure, you may have a lot more investment in security and scalability. So that pie chart isn't anything special. It's just a place to start. Okay, well, so guys, you will receive this, this pie chart in the information that we spread right after the webinar. Uh, and you'll have this starting point in case it supports your your next step on the priorities negotiations. That's um, right. Do you have some more questions in line there? Um, maybe someone would like to, to speak up, so just let us sure, know. Sure, on anything. I've been doing products so long that probably since most of you were born, I've been doing product management. So feel free to ask me some other entire question on product. Okay, well, we have a couple more minutes. So let me just ask uh, from the list of the registration uh, questions that we had from, from the participants. And so most of them are really close and some we have already answered. Uh, so um, there was a question about the multicultural stakeholders and mm. uh, what's the experience of dealing with this, maybe some tips and tricks or other recommendations you would have on managing the communication in there effectively. Yeah, so both multicultural and multi-language, I think, are, are challenges that most of the world understands, and I would say Americans are bad at. So, so here in the United States, you know, we want everyone to follow our style and our culture and our language and our word choice and spelling, 
which is you know a problem for us. But I think you want to be very uh, in tune to that. So there are some cultures where it's inappropriate or or unlikely that somebody will object directly. You know, there's some cultures where saying no is is much harder. You know, the Japanese historically never say no. But if you're listening carefully, there's lots of different ways they say no that are more polite, right? Uh, some of the Indian subcultures, you know, there's they're very strong um, push to say yes, right? So I think, um, you know, what do we do? We 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 want to build personal relationships with our stakeholders if we can, find some time to talk, learn a little bit about them, um, especially if you think you have a cultural communications issue. Uh, find someone else in your company who knows more about that culture uh, or make some time one-on-one -on -one for a, a conversation that's not so much about work. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, really important, because um, here in Silicon Valley, we have teams from all over the world. And when we're able to all go out to dinner and have some food and have a drink and talk about our favorite sports or kids or books or movies, uh, we tend to bridge, we tend to get over a lot of those cultural issues because we now see each other as people. So it's much harder to do remotely, but you know, find three minutes to ask somebody about their family or their favorite food or something that's a little more interesting and you'll get a sense of them as people and they will respect you more as people uh, is, is one of the good cultural hints. Okay, well, sounds like a great idea, basically, a lot of practice and, and just, you know, well, that's an investment to relationship deference, definitely, yes. and that, that's what you need to spend some time on. Um, Absolutely. Okay, um, I think we've covered pretty much here. Um, there was there were some generic things like tips and tricks on getting on with stakeholders and their conflicts. Um, also, there was something like stakeholders and, and agreements with stakeholders. So if you would have some tips to share, like, you know, how to, to get some agreements which help you run the relationship on the project. Right. Um, I, I think the thing to watch for is that um, some of your stakeholders and some of your companies will really respect an agreement, right? So, so some organizations have strong culture or ethic that if you and other people have you know, signed off on a roadmap or you know, whatever, that they'll stick with that. And other organizations, particularly some of the executives, forget their agreements, right? Or they don't care about agreements because today's deal is the only thing I think about. And so you want to uh, not assume that agreements are going to work. I think you want to test them. And if you make an agreement with one of your stakeholders and then it doesn't hold up, they, they won't stick with it, then you need to find some other way to approach that, which is generally going, for me, up the organization to somebody with enough um, stakeholder power to either get them in line or get them to agree to some other mechanism, right? Because an agreement is only good as both sides. Well, that's true. Uh, I think the, the people who are asking are actually facing this. And that's so right. That's a, and, and, a and, to right, and to understand their needs, because sometimes the world has changed and there's a reason to change our plan, but usually the world has not changed very much. And it's just somebody coming back asking again for the thing that we have not agreed to do. Oh yeah, right, well, there's, I'll... there's always a space for change. That's true. We're just right. facing it now so abruptly. That's right. There's always change. So, so you know, uh, think about your stakeholders as people. Try to understand their behavior. And, and uh, I try not to get angry or upset at my stakeholders. Instead, I try to understand what their motivations are so we can attack the problem and not the people. Um, there's probably one more before, before we kind of... Uh, um, we'll be closing in, in case we don't get any more questions, but there was sure. uh, this question about um, 
uh, identifying stakeholders. So how to identify the stakeholders and build efficient communication with them. So probably how not to miss the people who are yeah. critical to certain products. Sure. I'd be, so some of them are really obvious because they pound on you and they send you things all day long. But let's think about other internal stakeholders. Again, I, I think about the support or, or customer success team. My engineering and development team is a stakeholder. They're not just a delivery group. Um, there may be um, you know, training organizations out there. I think we, we want to think about how our end customers get value and the different groups in our company that interact with them. Uh, some, of the, some of our stakeholders are too quiet or too polite. And so they don't get a seat at the table. So we want to think about, you know, go through the whole organization chart. Legal probably doesn't matter. And finance probably doesn't matter. But folks who interact with customers are each going to have their own needs and their own point of view. So how do we not just listen to sales, but make sure we're also listening and paying attention to, you know, again, support and churn and upsell and the other folks in the company. Uh, well, I think that's, that's the part for me. And um, thank you so much for answering these questions, the, the okay. questions, the questions that came in on registration and um, during the, after the, the presentation, in fact. And well, before we come to the closing, I would just uh, like to double check if there are more questions for the participants in here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question to ask, please make sure that you drop a line uh, in the chat or in the chat box, Q&A box. Um, meanwhile, I would just say and notice that, yeah, well, we're glad that we had this um, opportunity to organize the webinar connecting well, to, to, over the, the ocean Ukraine to, to to America, well, actually San Francisco, California, and um, well, we're glad we're doing this with the um, product management for the product management community with uh, Bridge Mirana from, and hopefully this is not the this is the first and hopefully not the last webinar that we run together. Probably there will be more uh, topics to share and experience with and to help to contribute to, to our community members and their growth. Great, and thanks for letting me participate from far away. Thank you so much. Um, wish you all to stay safe and healthy these days. It's really important. And let's stay in touch and meet you on the new webinars. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Bye.